Good morning. Welcome to Sky News Breakfast. Thank you for joining us. Hospitals in India are continuing to turn away patients as COVID-19 spreads across the country. The country has seen a record number of new cases for the fourth day running. The United States says it's offered help after nearly one million people tested positive in just three days. Hospitals are overwhelmed and makeshift crematoria are being set up as cities struggle to cope. In a moment, we'll report from New Delhi on the growing crisis. Well, India's health ministry has just released the country's latest coronavirus figures, with a record number of new cases for a fourth day running. The country saw 349,691 confirmed cases between Saturday and Sunday, bringing the total to nearly 17 million. 2,767 people have died in the last 24 hours, making the official death toll 192,311. A warning, this report from our special correspondent Alex Crawford starts on pictures of body bags at a makeshift crematorium and contains distressing images throughout. There are too many dead to cope with right now in parts of the Indian capital and they're piled up in vehicles outside. The coronavirus rules mean this is where most relatives have to say goodbye. It's massively distressing and hugely undignified. There's no room left inside the crematorium, so they've spilled out into the open ground next door. <laughs> Coronavirus has ripped through this city and they're rushing to keep up with the devastation it's caused. So those with sick relatives are doing everything they can to keep them alive, queuing up to fill up their own oxygen cylinders. These are like gold dust in this city, with a black market value of four times their normal price. So whatever that I ask, I'll pay for it. So I have no clue how much amount he's going to ask. So when my number is going to come, when my chance is going to come, whatever amount he's asked for, I'll pay. If this would have happened like last year, then it would have been OK. Nobody knew about it. But they got a year and they wasted it completely on election rallies and all the other stuff. So it's heartbreaking, but uh, we don't have any other option. Some of these people have been lining up for hours, but they are getting access to oxygen. And they're asking if they can get hold of it. How come the government and the hospitals can't? A sports stadium opened only days ago as a COVID facility because of the shortage of beds in the city was turning away patients today. Full India is a problem. Yeah. But you've only got 50 people in there, I understand. oxygen. It's the same story across much of the capital, with several of the top hospitals still reporting an acute shortage of oxygen and the Prime Minister calling top-level meetings to try to solve the crisis. Why aren't you admitting any people? Why have you got no oxygen beds available? Not enough oxygen. That didn't stop Hina from begging them to admit her father. He's a rickshaw driver and suffering. He's also the only earner in his family. And they've spent three months' wages buying an oxygen tank from an illegal market so he can breathe. Rich or poor, Indians are doing whatever they can to keep breathing. Allahu Akbar. Every section of society has been hit, with the deaths rising at their fastest rate since the start of the pandemic and cutting across every creed and religion. But there's doubt about almost everything, with warnings that the surge in testing is now leading to a lack of testing material. Irfan is burying his brother, but with a death certificate he doesn't believe. 20 members, my family, no COVID, no positive. And as a COVID victim, that means the precious Muslim rituals are also banned. And their heartache is all the more because of what feels like gross insensitivity and a keen sense that all this could have been avoided. The country, I'm feeling very bad. I have money, I have everything, but I can't save my sister. Because no bed, nothing, nothing like that. No gas, no oxygen, no bed. Where we can do, where we can go. All across the city and across the country, coronavirus is leaving its scars on the land and on its people. 
And India is now the global centre of this pandemic, just as it's waning in many other countries. Alex Crawford, Sky News, New Delhi. Well, let's take a look at the latest coronavirus figures for the UK. There have been 2,061 new cases of coronavirus, while 32 more deaths have been reported, which means the total number of people who've died within 28 days of testing positive is now 127,427. On the vaccine rollout, another 119,953 people have received their first dose, while 448,139 received their second. In total, more than 45.5 million jabs have now been given out across the UK. And there'll be more on uh, the coronavirus pandemic in today's edition of Sophie Ridge on Sunday. Amongst the interviewees is Bill Gates, a prominent voice throughout the pandemic. Also on the programme, the International Trade Secretary Liz Truss and the Labour MP Jess Phillips. That's all coming up at half past eight this morning with Jane Secker. Also this morning, Labour is demanding the Prime Minister clarifies whether he asked Conservative supporters to help pay for the refurbishment of a flat in Downing Street. It follows claims by his former adviser, Dominic Cummings, who said Mr Johnson had been planning what he called an unethical, foolish, possibly illegal plan. Downing Street says the Prime Minister paid for work out of his own pocket. A warning, this report from our political correspondent, Joe Pike, begins with some flash photography. When he left... Many in number 10 hoped the Dominic Cummings drama was over. But it may just be getting started. Cheers. Cheers. Labour and the SNP are now calling for an inquiry into these revelations. Every day there's more evidence of this list. It is contemptuous. And frankly, this attempt by the Prime Minister to say, nothing to see here, nobody should be bothered with what we're doing, is also contemptuous. The stench of sleaze that is surrounding this UK Tory government now is becoming quite overpowering. There are some very serious allegations being levelled at Boris Johnson by somebody who was very, very close to him. But Boris Johnson argues the public aren't interested. Do you have any response to that comment from him? He was a close yes. political colleague of yours. My response is the one I'm giving, uh, which is that it was the right thing uh, to, to procure those ventilators and to have that interaction with Dyson in the way that we in the way that we did. But do and you think he was a source of that league? Do you think he was a source of that league? I don't think people care. What they care about is what was I doing back in March of, of last year? And people have, people have attacked me for that. But did, uh, you, did uh, you finger him as the source of that league? I, I don't think people give a monkeys, to be frank. Among the barrage of claims, Mr Cummings has entered the row over how Boris Johnson and his partner Carrie Simons spent tens of thousands of pounds on lavish renovations of their Downing Street flat, inspired by designer Lulu Little then tried to get a Tory donor to secretly pay for it. Mr Cummings wrote, I told him I thought his plans to have donors secretly pay for the renovation were unethical, foolish, possibly illegal and almost certainly broke the rules. Mr Johnson has now paid the bill himself, number 10, so he stuck to the rules. Mr Cummings also suggests civil servants believed this man, Tory adviser Henry Newman, leaked details of England's second Covid lockdown to the media. But Boris Johnson considered cancelling the investigation into that leak because Mr Newman is a close friend of Carrie Simons. If you talk to people here, they are worried. Worried about what Dominic Cummings knows and worried about what he may reveal next. There is also speculation in two of today's newspapers that Mr Cummings at some point may make a direct link between the Prime Minister's handling of the Covid pandemic and the very high UK death toll. So far from opinion polls, there is absolutely no sign the Prime Minister or his party standing has been hit. But the longer this carries on, the greater chance that may happen. Boris Johnson says people don't give a monkeys about all this. But in Barnard Castle, the town famously visited by Dominic Cummings, it seems some do. Yeah, yeah, I give a monkeys. I like Boris. I think he's busy doing a fantastic job. You know, things that go on, they, don't, they think the public don't care what they do. I've just got the report and papers through and I will definitely be giving it a, a great deal of thought this time. Department for Health was just a sort of smoking ruin. In Dominic Cummings will be back giving evidence to Parliament next month. It's likely to be another explosive intervention from the man some now call Nuclear Dom. Joe Pike, Sky News, Westminster. 
As part of the campaign to urge the under 50s to get the coronavirus vaccine, a series of photographs documenting the national vaccination programme have been released. Well, one of the journalists who took the pictures is Jude Palmer, who uh, joins me now. Good morning to you. Uh, what was the uh, brief that, that you were given? What were you asked to, to capture specifically? Good morning. Morning. Yes, I mean, I, th I think what we wanted to do was we, we sort of see the stats every day of how many people are getting vaccinated. Um, and I think we wanted to bring those sort of to life, really, and bring that, bring all of those figures that we see every day to life through the human stories and to really sort of capture the scope of, of the human endeavour that's going on in terms of the vaccine rollout, um, the collaboration, the working together and, and the spirit, really, that's around it, uh, particularly the organisation. Yeah, we're seeing some of the, the images now and uh, some of the, the sites for uh, vaccination, more than 2,800 um, centres. Uh, and you were asked to, to, to shoot in, in Salisbury. Yes. Um, so we've been shooting all over. I mean, there's a team of us, as we say, we've got um, we're covering the four nations. So we've got Glenn Edwards in Wales. We've got Liam McBurney in Northern Ireland, myself covering England. And we'll have somebody in Scotland shortly. Um, so I've been covering the breadth of England um, and going to all kinds of different places from uh, soft play areas to squash courts to Salisbury Cathedral. And that was just amazing, really, Salisbury Cathedral, because the whole cathedral was turned into a vaccination centre. And um, they were actually playing organ music as you went into cathedral to have your vaccination. And I spoke to the musical director and said, why, why were they doing that? Because it was quite a powerful experience when you walk into this amazing, beautiful cathedral um, and everybody's walking in to be protected. Um, so whether you're religious or not, it, it gave you a very sort of spiritual feeling. Um, and he said it was to make people feel at ease um, and to reassure people. And it definitely did that. And it was just a very poignant moment, I think. Yeah, we were seeing uh, images of that, quite atmospheric and uh, interesting that that thought was put into, you know, what people might be feeling as they, they go to get their, their first uh, vaccination. Yeah, I think, you know, we all have our own individual stories about how we've dealt with the pandemic and how we deal with the vaccine. And, you know, everyone I speak to, they, they have their own journey with that. And when you sit in that chair to get your vaccination, it means different things to different people. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the overwhelming sense was of relief um, and just, I'm just relieved to have it done um, and, and happiness, really, because it moves us all a step further to something that resembles normality. Uh, and were people um, happy, willing to be photographed, did you find? Yes, a lot were, because a lot, a lot of people wanted to help persuade other people to have the vaccine. So um, there was a lot of people that said, yes, I'll do anything to help. Um, and, you know, this goes from all of the people that were involved from when you arrive in the car park to um, all the volunteers, all the marshals, all the way through the whole system. There's, there's a sense of the human endeavour that this is and the spirit around it and people willing to, wanting to do their best for everybody, really. And, and you know, that was really the overwhelming feeling. Um, so, yes, most people, some people didn't. Some people wanted it to be, you know, their own private journey. But many people were willing to help. Are there any particular images that, that, that struck you as, as the photographer? Anything that remains with you? Um, there was, there was, a, there was, the Salisbury was one. There was another of, we, um, we, ha, we, I was photographing a vaccination bus because if there's some areas that have a low uptake, um, I was in the middle of Leeds and they have a vaccination bus that actually goes into those communities. And a lady and her husband walked around the corner and she was from Somalia and she walked around the corner and she came onto the vaccination bus to get vaccine. She was she was quite nervous, quite anxious about having it done. Um, there's actually an image of her there as I'm speaking. Um, but she went ahead, she got the vaccine. And when she came out, I chatted to her and her husband. And her, their son was actually a tropical disease doctor in Somalia. And she said, now we can phone our son and tell him that we've been vaccinated. And she was really happy about that. So I think that was a big moment as well, because she wasn't expected to get vaccinated. And as she walked around the corner, the vaccination bus was there, so it was brilliant. And what sort of impact has it had on you? Because nice to be able to be uh, taking photographs of a, essentially a good news story. Yeah, I mean, I think through what we've all been through, I think if you can take any positives, you need to take them. Um, and I think that this is a, a massive thing, in, a historical thing. So as a photojournalist, you know, you want to bear witness to these these events. But you have to be a little bit more than that in this. You have to engage a little bit more. 
Um, and I've, you know, because you have to talk to people, you have to um, find where the centres are, you have, you know, there's a lot of work involved in doing it. And I think that to be part of history in this way, as a photojournalist is a big thing, but also as a human. And, you know, I've got children and, and we've all got family and friends and stuff that you care about. So to be part of something that's so important in our lives um, has been very, well, it's been very memorable. It will stay with me forever, this project. Indeed, very arresting images there. Thank you so much for speaking to us, uh, Jude Palmer, photojournalist. journalist. Thank you. 27 people are reported to have died after a fire at a hospital in Iraq. It's claimed the blaze started after an oxygen cylinder exploded inside the building, which was treating coronavirus patients. At least 46 others are reported to have been injured. In the last hour, we've heard from the Indonesian president on the search for a missing submarine. He said the Navy has now confirmed that the vessel has sunk. 53 crew were on board when it was, went missing off the coast of Bali on Wednesday. The search for the uh, submarine is continuing. The BBC's Princess Diana interview in 1995 was arguably one of the biggest scoops in broadcasting history and earned the journalist Martin Bashir a BAFTA. But that success has been tarnished with new claims that he faked documents to secure the interview. Sky News has now seen internal BBC memos which form part of the inquiry. They suggest the corporation was more concerned about punishing whistleblowers than investigating whether the documents had been falsified. Our royal correspondent Rhiannon Mills reports. For 25 years they were kept within the BBC. Documents seen by Sky News now part of the inquiry into how Panorama secured that interview with Princess Diana in 1995. They include press office logs from around the time it was aired that show claims Martin Bashir may have told Diana she was being spied on. Chris Blackhurst is one of those mentioned. He was tipped off by a source while working at The Independent. I made the first call to them saying that he'd been looking into MI5 and he somehow, uh, she'd been encouraged, even pressured, that was probably too strong, but encouraged to give an interview on the back of this. And there was definitely a cover-up, and the BBC were constantly pushing me back. An interview with the princess was the ultimate scoop. Martin Bashir, a relatively unknown reporter, a surprising choice. But the documents appeared to show inconsistencies about how he met Diana. Tony Hall was managing director of news and current affairs at the time and later became director general of the BBC. In a statement to the Board of Governors, he says Diana's brother, Earl Spencer, introduced Martin to the Princess of Wales. But a document from April 1996 says there had been no intermediary. Sources close to the princess have told me they would never have met without Lord Spencer, who last year called for the inquiry into what the BBC knew about Bashir faking documents. It's only now, 25 years after that interview was aired, that we're really getting a sense of how little people on the outside knew about the investigations that were going on within the BBC. So you can see from this first document, a journalist asked if Martin Bashir had been officially disciplined. The reply that he got from the press office was that he had not. There's also this further document, which is a statement that Tony Hall had written to the Board of Governors, in which he explains what's been going on. And it says, I've talked to Martin, Martin Bashir, at length about his reasons for compiling the graphic. It says he has none other than he wasn't thinking. I believe he is, even with his lapse, honest and an honourable man. He is contrite. But a further paragraph at the end highlights just how much emphasis there was on dealing with those who'd leaked material to the press. It says here, we're taking steps to ensure that the graphic designer involved, Matthew Wiesler, will not work for the BBC again. In addition, it says, we will work to deal with the leakers and remove persistent troublemakers from the programme. We've been told Matt Wiesler only found out last year about his apparent blacklisting. We approached Martin Bashir and Lord Hall for comment and were told by the BBC the BBC is determined to get to the truth about the circumstances and has commissioned Lord Dyson to carry out a fully independent investigation. Martin Bashir is cooperating fully and won't be making any public statements while the investigation is ongoing.
It's understood Lord Dyson, a former judge, is on track to report back next month. Those closest to Diana hoping for some degree of clarity, even with the most important witness, no longer alive. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News. When Greta Thunberg decided to sit outside the Swedish parliament for three weeks in 2018 demanding climate action, she couldn't have known the extraordinary impact her activism would have around the world. Now, the climate change movement in many countries is increasingly being led by young people. From the UK to Australia, North America and Uganda, Sky News has spoken to some of the young people leading the debate. Our correspondent, Ashna Huranak, reports. A generation fighting for their futures, determined to not let their lives be crippled by climate change. This is now the soundtrack of school curriculums too. People aren't taking that action and aren't realising what they need to do. And I think as a generation, we're doing really well with sort of taking that emotion and using it in order to take action. Because we know it's our generation that are going to be impacted by it and it's us that are going to be affected by it, it's really important that we make that change. Emma is one of the UK's first climate change teachers and says the appetite for making a difference is infectious. Giving them that... Um, that perseverance and that determination to go, I'm not going to let this go, I'm not going to let this go, I'm going to keep fighting for it, but in a polite way. Across the world, the climate voices are getting louder and younger. 16-year-old Anjali is taking the Australian government to court over a new coal mine. She says the burden of responsibility weighs heavy on young shoulders. I think that while it is really empowering, you know, like I come home sometimes at the end of a long day of, um, you know, a school strike meeting or, um, you know, the end of the press conference. And I feel really accomplished, but then it's also kind of bittersweet because it's like, it sucks that I have to take my future into my own hands. From the front line of the climate crisis in Uganda, activist Vanessa says many are disconnected from what they can't see. There are communities that are being affected right now. There are communities whose boats are sinking faster or burning faster. But at the end of it all, if nothing is done about this, then everybody is going to catch fire, then every boat is going to drown. Kevin is demanding cleaner air for Americans. He says he's vocal about demanding change because he cares. Young people are really making the connections between women's rights, uh, civil rights and environmentalism and climate change. That's the reason why young people are so heavily involved is because we want to grow up in a world where we don't have to be plagued by these injustices, these disparities and inequalities. As leaders of the future, their passion is driving the climate movement, a generation of trailblazers determined not to be drowned out. Ashna Harinag, Sky News. And our new daily climate show will be back from tomorrow. That's at half past six and half past nine in the evening here on Sky News. Time now for a look at the weather with Isabel. And it's uh, still lovely, but not as lovely as yesterday. And just the temperatures and just the way it feels, I suppose. But, I mean, it's going to look gorgeous. I, I mean, the sunshine is stunning. Uh, just a little bit of fair weather cloud around. It's just quite a cool breeze and it'll be more widespread, I think, that northeasterly today. So more of us seeing a knock-on effect on the temperature. Let's take a look. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. So we've got high pressure in charge, which is keeping the weather fine and dry. But around the high, it's quite breezy, quite gusty actually across the southwest. And that wind coming in from a cool east or northeasterly direction, bringing in a little bit of fair weather cloud to parts of eastern England and temperatures on the coast. They're struggling. Chilly North Sea, of course, at this time of year. So some places only 9 to 11 degrees. But come inland, probably around, say, 13 for the Midlands and southeast England. And then around 15, 16 for West Wales. A little down on yesterday's, the west of Ireland, 17 or 18. Parts of northern Scotland, again, up to about the 17 Celsius mark. Not bad, strong sunshine, remember, wherever you are. And then as we head through this evening and tonight, the winds ease in the south. It'll be chilly again with a touch of frost. Not a bad start to the week, though, in southern Britain and Ireland. But the north, we'll see changes with some rain heading in. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. You're watching Sky News Breakfast coming up. After the break, we'll take a look at what's making the front pages of the newspapers with the editor of the Sunday Express, Michael Booker. Do stay with us.
fine and sunny Sunday, thanks to high pressure, but it's still windy across the far south and cool northeasterly winds will bring in more cloud to eastern parts through the course of the day. Temperatures only 11 on the east coast, but further west maybe up to 17 or 18 Celsius. Quite strong sunshine, mind you. And then after frost tonight, we will see some changes tomorrow with rain heading in from the north. In terms of air pollution today, it's mostly low, but there will be some pockets of moderate pollution, especially around the Western Isles and Western Scotland. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. Joining me now to take us through the newspapers is the editor of the Sunday Express, Michael Booker. Good morning to you again. Uh, let's start morning. with the Times uh, and this piece, likening the split between uh, Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings to a, a civil war. Yeah, they always like to get macho and civil war and there's also mention of it being like the mafia in there as well. Uh, but when it's just, you know, lots of uh, pale looking politicians, middle, middle class men bickering is what it really is. But they always like to make it look dramatic. And uh, it's Tim Shipman uh, in The Sunday Times writing this piece. And he is well plugged in and has been uh, similar to both camps, both the Cummings and Boris Johnson's camps over the years. And it's just interesting because, you know, when Dominic Cummings, uh, the uh, Prime Minister's a former chief advisor came out with his blog post on Friday, uh, joining in and uh, answering his critics in some cases and uh, making allegations of, against the prime minister and denying he'd been leaking some of these stories that had been coming out recently. I think a lot of people expected the Sunday newspapers to have some huge bombshell that could ultimately take down the prime minister, but nothing so far. It just seems to be a lot of bluster, a lot of uh, long written pieces for uh, Whitehall insiders. There's some good detail in this talking about how this is a civil war and what it is is that we had the vote leave family of which Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson were key members of and then he's got Boris Johnson's real family which is Carrie Simmons at the head of it uh, his fiance and it seems as time has gone on the botting between the uh, the two sides of heads uh, between the two sides uh, has, has got too much. There was that split in December last year, and this has been festering ever since. And uh, Dominic Cummings uh, still thinks he can win the war, according to this piece, but so does Boris Johnson. And ultimately, according to Tim Shipman, it could bring them both down. Uh, so it is fairly dramatic stuff. It also, there's a great line in it that says that uh, Dominic Cummings is the sort of guy who brings nuclear weapons to a pillow fight. So there's some good drama in it. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, take us to the, the mail. Uh, what's the story about um, Baroness Boothroyd being investigated over missing a, a sexual harassment course as the, the former speaker? Yeah, well, a pioneer for women and women's rights and, you know, the first women, well, only woman uh, speaker so far. We've got a deputy woman speaker at the moment. But, yeah, she was a, a pioneer, but she's currently been investigated by the Commons uh, Watchdog because she hasn't done an online training course in sexual harassment or uh, how to avoid it and how to combat it. Um, now, she has a very good excuse because she's had open heart surgery. She's told them this and they're still investigating her anyway. Now, it's this sort of thing because oh, clearly we want to stamp out sexual harassment in the workplace and everywhere and people need to be aware of it. People need to do these courses. But when someone has an excuse like this, she's a 91-year-old pioneer. She is ill at the moment. She says, look, I want to take this course. You can always learn new things, but I'm slightly indisposed at the moment. But they're still going to go on with this investigation. And I think that's where people um, raise their eyebrows at these sort of pushes uh, towards uh, the e education of people in these matters, because it seems to be, it does seem to be just for the sake of it and box ticking, rather than getting someone to do it when they're fit and healthy and, uh, and can do it properly. Yeah, hopefully it's just a, an admin error and, and that will be well, uh, corrected. Yeah. Uh, to the Times, um, uh, and this is about, um, well, also about uh, sexism and uh, a primary school banning certain sexist, well, con what they consider to be sexist phrases and words. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's like they've, they've taught the kids to be sort of like the, the police in the school for what teachers say, which I think, again, may raise eyebrows with, with certain people, particularly some parents uh, who are probably more traditional in these ways and think teachers should be in charge rather than the pupils. But the kids have been given these little signs, and particularly the girls, and if anyone accidentally says, come on, guys, let's get going, the girls will then pick up a sign and says, I'm not a guy, uh, with an exclamation mark. 
and the teachers are then felt uh, told off. Also in this school, which is Anderton Park uh, Primary School in Birmingham, uh, the kids have been, uh, if they hear something untoward from, say, a supervisor in the uh, playground, and on one occasion, one of the supervisors said to a boy, boys don't skip, and took a skipping rope on it. Two girls ran to the head teacher, told on the supervisor, the supervisor got a telling off, Funnily enough, the supervisors no longer decided to work for the school anymore. So, uh, yes, these, the, we've got a tiny little police force running around. Obviously, uh, clearly, we should, again, we should stamp out sexism and stamp out an early age, but it does seem to be putting a bit of a responsibility on kids. Yes, indeed. Uh, the Telegraph to round up. Um, hackers, the fear of hackers uh, crashing the Oscars party this year. Not, not normally sort of the, uh, the people on the, the red carpet trying to get in that way, but, but on the internet, that's what they're worried about. Well, apparently, yes. I mean, it's the Oscars night tonight. There's going to be some online parties where you can go to a virtual party with Elton John if you pay uh, a few hundred thousand pounds for oh. the pleasure. And he will virtually turn up at your table and speak to you with David Furnish for a while. Now, I'm not sure how what an online hacker would do to get into this party. And if you can, I don't know, I've never had an online volivant or an online <laughs> uh, glass of warm champagne, but apparently it's worth a while for these hackers to do that. But I don't know, I think sometimes hackers just do this for the sake of it. I think we should yeah. just leave the lobbies to themselves in their virtual lobby world. I'm still waiting for my online invitation, as I'm sure you are. Michael, thanks for taking us through the papers. Good to see you, thank you.